Praise be Jesus Christ, and welcome back to episode 21, season 3 of Carmelcast. I'm Brother Pier Giorgio of Christ the King, and I'm joined by Brother John Mary of Jesus Crucified and Father Michael Joseph of St. Therese. And Carmelcast is a production of the Institute of Carmelite Studies Publications, and you can visit our website at www.icspublications.org. And uh, today we're wrapping up this season with a final episode on St. Therese. And um, as always, or at least in the, the last couple episodes, or with the exception of the first episode maybe, I've been asking this pop question. Oh, um, and I did give you, this is a not so pop question because <laughs> I gave you some warning this time because I, I really wanted to, the theme of this episode is really sort of the legacy of St. Therese and the way in which that she is so present uh, to, this, to this world and to our church. Um, so I wanted to uh, give you guys some brainstorm time to think about ways in which St. Therese has really come into your life in a special way. Um, and the way that I phrased it was actually, um, how has she crashed into your life? Because I think that really describes, uh, describes her very well. I hope this, this picture doesn't crash at some point <laughs> during, into our lives during, during this episode while we're filming. Um, but it's, it's been a... You know, she's, she's so powerful in some people's lives, so I want to ask you to give a little bit of a witness about a way in which that she has, she has impacted your life in a special way. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, I could just maybe start, as, as you said, my, I took the title of St. Therese, and um, she was really kind of the first saint I met. You know, I had a big conversion when I was about 18, and, um, and when I was maybe a year after, a friend I had just made, a Catholic friend, um, gave me this story of soul, the ICS edition, everything. And, uh, and I, you know, coming out of a very different lifestyle, I almost had nothing in common with St. Therese, I mean, in, in almost every way. But as I read it, I was, oh my gosh, like this is like someone who I feel so connected to and um, a kind of soul sister in a sense, like someone that you just, you just feel this, this great bond with. And, but I realized she really crashed in my life a couple years later, so I was already in seminary at this point. And, um, and very devoted to her, still reading her. And I met another seminarian who really had a big devotion to St. Therese, and I, and I started feeling jealous. You know? <laughs> and and I, I began to experience these different feelings of like possessiveness of St. Therese, and, and I would find that when I'd meet someone who said they love St. Therese, I'd try to challenge them, almost like, oh, do you, like, you don't love her as much as I do, you know? And, uh, and when I became more conscious of this, I said, okay, it's gone a little too far, you know, I need to, <laughs> I need to but, but it just, that's how much of an impact she had on me, that I would actually get jealous, you know, about other people's devotion to her. I don't think I'm there anymore but uh <laughs> but <laughs> so that's good and i know i have your your ordination uh card in my breviary and you have a huge picture of saint therese on the front even though at the time you had no idea that you'd become a carmel yeah so yeah exactly it's incredible to see that she was that that meaningful to you that you thought to, to have her on the, the front of your ordination card. Mm -hmm. yeah that's powerful Definitely. yeah um, I, I feel like my, my experience of Therese is like totally the opposite of yours. <laughs> uh, I, I often very affectionately refer to uh, Therese as my, my worst saint enemy. Um, <laughs> and um, yeah, I guess I don't remember exactly how that relationship started, but um, I've always, I, I've, I find that Therese's message is challenging um, to me in particular. Um, She's almost like this older sister that has everything down and it's like is always challenging you and your weaknesses and you just like uh, can't do it. <laughs> That's how I feel sometimes. So um, because I, yeah, I feel like Therese is like so many things that I'm not. I mean, she's just like patient and humble and loving and all of these things. And uh, those, those are really her gifts. And um, yeah, so I find her to be always to be challenging me spiritually but because i joke about her being my worst saint enemy i also realize that she's probably the saint that i need the most in my life um, to challenge me in those ways to encourage me along and so uh, i had a friend in seminary who used to always take this photo of um, saint therese that he had and when i wasn't aware of it he put the photo in my in my room in the seminary so i'd walk into the room and there saint therese would be because um, he knew how I found her challenging. And then when I started my novitiate, I remember moving into the room, I unpacked all my things. I sat down in, the, the, in my chair and, um, you know, the rooms are very stark. It was, um, you know, there's a bear cross on the wall. 
you know, you have your bed and your dresser, and then there's this this picture of Saint Therese in the room, and she's just staring at me. So I sit down. I'm just beginning my novitiate, and she's just sitting there looking at me. And after a, a little few days of that, I was like, I can't do this, and I just took the picture and turned it around because <laughs> she was she was challenging. But eventually, I turned it back around, and like I said, she's uh, she's become a. Um, yeah, I'm very, I'm very devoted to her, but I would say that we have a very a, a special relationship. So. <laughs> well, I think it gives people hope, too, because I've met several people in my life who, with how popular St. Therese is, but just do not like St. Therese for different reasons. And um, I think you could be a patron of those people. And look how you've overcome so much. Starting a sort of group of people, devoted Catholics that don't like St. Therese. <laughs> <laughs> There's always room for things, but... <laughs> I was once like you too. Yeah. And you can move on beyond this uh, barrier. <laughs> well, some of it was realizing that a lot of what I didn't like about Saint Therese wasn't true about her. Mm. Um, there are certain caricatures of her that I didn't like, and uh, finding out, um, yeah, that those aren't necessarily true. So, particularly by reading her letters and reading the last conversations, those kind of really helped me to see who Therese really is. Um, and then, apart from that, just seeing how she wasn't always the way the end product either mm-hmm. she was it was a, a, a work in her, throughout her life of coming to this this uh, place of sanctity so i hope that there's hope for me too <laughs> as i'm journey, journey going through that journey well for me um story of a soul was the first book i read as a seminarian and a diocesan seminarian and uh, i spent four years in the seminary really uh, struggling with the question of religious life, and uh, and so uh, after four years of, of just sort of waffling back and forth, will I will I stay next year? Will I come back next year? Will I will I go to discern uh, another vocation? Um, will I discern to become? Uh, at the most of the time, I was discerning with with the Carmelites as well, um, and it came to a point where uh, I was I was ready to make the decision. And I remember I went to a church, and there was a statue of Saint Therese. And uh, I just went to the statue and I, I said, Therese, I entrust my vocation to you. And uh, little did I know that, uh, so I, I left the church, went home, and I had a missed call with a voicemail. And the voicemail was from the vocation director uh, of the Discalced Carmelites. Uh, and he left a message saying, uh, essentially, I need you to, to call me. I want to, I want to talk to you about something. Um, I, I, I want to invite you to, to apply. Um, and it just so happened the timing was, it was not very long after I, maybe minutes after I had said this prayer, um, single digit minutes <laughs> even. And, uh, and so every year since then, uh, for her novena, I've always, I've always rededicated my, my vocation to her. Uh, so in that way, she, she made it very clear to me that she wanted me to be, uh, I, I've always been her brother in a, in a way, but she wanted me to be um, a religious brother as well. Uh, as a Carmelite. Now, my mom was with me at this time, in this moment that I was praying, and, and I'm sure she'll, she'll write in the comments whether or not I, I prayed this out loud. I think I did, in fact. Um, so I think there, there's always the chance that Therese was answering my mom's simultaneous prayers and not mine. <laughs> uh, but I think Therese was able to, to work with what little I was able to give uh, in entrusting my, my vocation to her. But uh, it could have been that she was just answering my mom's prayers to like, she would did. you just get this boy out of my house? <laughs> <laughs> She's a holy woman. Too. <laughs> and she was at the time, she, she became a Carmelite before me. She's a, a third order secular. Uh, yeah. So she, uh, you know, coming into the church when I was in college, um, up until that point, Therese was, was in our house and statues and different things like that. Um, so she's always, you know, from, from the time I was probably in high school, uh, Therese was in my conscience, mm-hmm. you know, subconsciously being present around the house and things like that. So she's always had a, an eye on me, I guess, so to speak. Yeah. So cool. Awesome. Moving uh, into the content of our episode, though, it, uh, it makes sense to, to begin with these sort of questions and stories because we, we want to talk about um, kind of the story of you know Therese after her death and how she became this great known as this great intercessor in the church um, how she was very quickly beatified and canonized 
um, the the spread uh, like wildfire of the manuscript of the manuscripts of her of her of her spiritual biogra- biography autobiography the story of a soul so all of these things how the all these things contributed to kind of her her rise to fame this little uh, young 24 year old nun uh, who lived kind of in the corner of of France uh, in kind of a no no name town yeah. that is now today very well known because of her because, because of she her. was yeah. she lived there. Um, so it's, it's a beautiful story. I, as someone who's involved in publishing, um, it's, it's one that fascinates me because the history of the spread of the manuscript is, is really a fantastic story. Um, if anyone who's listening or watching knows Ken Burns, you should tell him to do a <laughs> documentary on, on, the, on the story of a soul and how it came to be because it really is uh, a fascinating, fascinating story. Yeah. But I guess to, to get us going... Um, the, the manuscript of Story of a Soul, as Therese knew them, um, was, was in the form of three different manuscripts. So maybe we can talk about, uh, because uh, when you talk about Story of a Soul, you kind of refer to these, these sort of buzzwords, manuscript A, manuscript B, and manuscript C. So it would be good to kind of talk about that and yeah. what exactly, what chapters they are and, and, and how they came to be. Because they are, they're very different, yeah. the three of them. And that's one of the reasons why we, we designate them as such. Yes. Yeah. Well, and it, it, you can see too that in some of the older editions, you don't have those three manuscripts. You know, or at least it's not split up. But we can mm-hmm. now having her all of her authentic writings. We'll get into that, of course. But um, we can see, you know, each one is distinct, and each one has its own kind of history. So, so I guess the first of these manuscripts was manuscript A, what we call manuscript A, which today in the ICS version uh, that covers chapters one through eight. Um, and this is really the, the bulk uh, of Story of the Soul, the chapters that everyone knows and loves, um, telling, recounting the story of her childhood uh, up until um, she enters Carmel, right? Uh, the story of her going to Rome, the story of the, sort of the, the, uh, the, illnesses, the illness of her childhood um, and, and the miracle at Christmas. All of those stories are recounted in Manuscript A. And... Um, one, uh, one you know, important thing that really distinguishes the, the three manuscripts um, is who they were written to. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later on in terms of how that got changed around a little bit, um, unbeknownst to many early readers of Story of a Soul. But manuscript A in particular was written um, by Therese to her sister Pauline, uh, who at the time was the prioress. Uh, we know her as Mother Agnes as well. And this was written in 1895, so we're talking uh, two years before her her death, and really before even um, she began showing symptoms of an illness. Uh, So one uh, kind of a quote that comes from this, uh, from uh, Mother Agnes, she says that, uh, um, well, I guess kind of the the situation was that uh, Mother Agnes, Sister Marie, uh, Marie, the, the, the Martin sister, and Therese were, were sitting around at recreation uh, recounting, you know, stories of their childhood. And, uh, and Marie, uh, the oldest sister, said to Pauline, uh, her older sister, even though that she was the prior, so that they call her, she calls her mother, but here's the quote, uh, Mother, what a pity we haven't got all that in writing. If you were to ask Sister Therese of the child Jesus to write down her childhood memories for us, I'm sure we'd find them very entertaining. And then so Pauline uh, replies to Marie, I couldn't ask for anything better. And so she turns then to Therese and says, I order you to write down all of your childhood memories. And she kind of said that facetiously, but with with direction. Um, You know, these memories brought a lot of pleasure to them. And because Therese had such a such a such a powerful memory, uh, a capacity for remembering the things of her childhood, um, it was really it. I'm sure it really brought a lot of joy to her older sisters to hear her perspective of her, of the events of her childhood, mm-hmm. uh, from a young girl's perspective. Yeah. So maybe you guys can t- talk a little bit about uh, about manuscript A and and kind of its characteristics as well. Yeah, I think we see some of the I mean just the power of Therese's memory in manuscript A in the sense that just how vivid the memories are. And how entertain so it's like very entertaining for us to read. I just think of how great it would be to hear Therese herself recount because she, I mean, she wrote them down well. But 
we can see why she was asked to recount these is be because in her telling, she was known to be kind of like a good mimic. And like, uh, I can just imagine her kind of acting all of these things out with her sisters. And it's just so entertaining to them that they're like, you have to write, write these things down so that we remember. And I think we can pick up on a lot of that in reading uh, the manuscript. And she also used, besides her memory, she used a lot of letters that she had from, uh, I think from her, that her letters that her mother had written, uh, for instance, about her. Uh, so some of the earlier events of her life, she doesn't remember firsthand, but she has access to these letters that her mother wrote. So she's able to incorporate those into uh, her writing as well. Mm -hmm. Well, I was just thinking too, as you were reading the quote, that it's, it's, it's nice to be superior, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you can just say these things. And, um, and she took it so seriously, you know? And she spent, I think it was uh, almost nine months um, you know, with the little time she had, you know, because she was very busy, a lot of responsibilities, and, and, you know, you know how hard it is, too, sometimes to get in the mode of writing or something, you know, and it's just like, once you get into it, you kind of want to stay there if, if you're in it, and she'd have a half an hour here, you know, 40 minutes there, um, to just, and she just used all of her free time, you know, the little free time she had, and she just did this for her sister, um, and so I think that's what kind of just strikes me, is just, it was really a, a work of love and obedience, mm -hmm. um, and that, uh, when she, when she gave them finally to her sister, you think all this work that she's put into it, the sister just kind of nodded, you know, and took <laughs> it. And then, uh, and then didn't, she didn't, herself didn't even have time to read it for almost a year. So you think not saying anything to Therese, like, oh, that was great, or like, I really appreciate it, or, you know, and you know how we can get with that sort of stuff and uh, not feeling appreciated. But Therese, Mother Agnes said, um, Therese just totally let it go and she wasn't mother Agnes wasn't trying to be cruel or anything or try to but she just literally didn't have time and didn't know what a gem this was she had no idea that this was like this classic you know so um, that's I think kind of strikes me about it too is just the way it happened yeah you know yeah I think that that really covers kind of the the, the aspects of the of Therese writing this section of story of the soul uh, one thing that you mentioned that it really it reminds me a little bit of Therese's namesake Saint Teresa because she herself had very little time to write um, and was writing under obedience for the most yeah. part. And uh, despite the fact that she would take small s snippets of time to write, everything is very coherent yeah. for both of them, for Teresa and Therese. So it really kind of speaks to the providence and grace that, that God gives uh, when someone is held under obedience yeah. to do something <laughs> that maybe that well, maybe they wouldn't do of their own accord, right? Yeah. So uh, then the next uh, manuscript that, that Therese wrote chronologically, and we named them chronologically as well, is manuscript B. And this really is chapter 9 of Story of the Soul. And this is what uh, probably has become among the most um, famous of Therese's writings because it, it, in, it includes her, her testimony to her vocation to be love. Um, What's interesting about this manuscript, the section of Story of a Soul, is that it was written uh, to Therese's oldest sister, Marie, uh, while she was on her personal private retreat. Um, and this is also after she had begun to show symptoms of her illness, of, of her chronic or her terminal illness of tuberculosis. So uh, Marie and I think, I think all of the sisters had an intuition that maybe Therese was... Uh, was her illness was serious was pretty serious you know in terms of their understanding even though this was written uh, about a year a full 12 months before her death mm -hmm. um, we have to remember that her illness really lasted about 18 months so Marie knowing that her her youngest sister is ill uh, writes uh, a letter to Saint, Saint Therese asking her if she would explain uh, her her spiritual life to her, uh, so maybe we can talk a little bit about about this about this exchange between Marie and Therese that became manuscript B. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was very providential too because Therese was on retreat, you know, so she would have some time and some ability to reflect, you know, and be able to to write. Um, and also, I think it's just it's cool how Marie was so you know sometimes we overlook Marie. Um, in terms of her sisters, she doesn't always have the biggest place, but how essential her role was, you know, in the development of Therese's message, um, we can see that there. But that essentially, like, as you said, it was a letter asking her, you know, to explain kind of her, this, this, her little way, the secrets she said that Jesus gives to you, you know, and 
Um, so she knew, you know, Therese was gifted in a special way as, as well, um, even though Therese hadn't maybe unfolded it all yet. But then it gives this opportunity for them, this, basically it's one long letter, you know, and, and when you see the original too, um, it's, you know, written very small, you know, around the margins, you know, it's just like, it's just a very, like she, she's just giving it all in just one kind of f fell swoop. And, um, and in this letter, you know, she just goes through, you know, it's kind of like a, a letter to Jesus, sort of she writes, you know, in this way to the Lord, um, describing, you know, her, as you mentioned, her vocation, her vocation to be love in the heart of the church. Um, the parable of the little bird and the eagle kind of talking about, you know, her, her kind of helping describe her little way and what that means. Um, so just so many jewels of what we know of her doctrine, why she's a doctor of the church, are in just this one letter, basically. Yeah, we see a lot. I think uh, her entire spirituality really kind of distilled in a beautiful way yeah. in just one, one chapter. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a good... A good thing to read uh, even just on its own to pray with reflect with um, because you really get a good sense of, of what it is that Therese's message is and what she's teaching uh, to the to the world mm -hmm. yeah and it, what's interesting about manuscript B as well this chapter is that uh, it's entirely possible that Pauline had no idea about about this this manuscript I mean, we don't know the kind of the intricacies of, of whether I mean it was written as a personal note to Marie mm -hmm. uh, so to what extent did Therese's other sisters know about this this uh, this letter this this thing that would become so important pivotal in, in the man in the story of the soul um, it wouldn't wasn't really revealed as to be a part of it until after Therese's death mm -hmm. so it, it also it has that that personal aspect that uh, Therese really did not, uh, she intended it for one person, yeah. right? Yes. We also, I think, get the impression that, um, well, so this was written the year after uh, Therese finished Manuscript A, but we, I don't think Pauline had really even read the first manuscript yet. No. And so Pauline didn't quite even know yet the, the richness of what Therese had. But Marie saw that, yeah. and that's why she there was, she saw something in Therese that maybe Pauline hadn't even recognized yet, mm -hmm. which Pauline would later recognize when she read Manuscript A. But at this point, Marie saw something, and so she asked Therese, like, expand on this. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so then, you know, Manuscript C starts, uh, came, up, well, came about uh, after uh, Agnes uh, was uh, replaced as the prioress by Mother Marie de Gonzog. And uh, she, I, she must have, you know, not no longer being prioress, she had a little bit more time on her hands probably, and, and maybe a light bulb went off in her head. Oh yeah, there's that, uh, that manuscript that Therese wrote, and <laughs> she now finally takes the time to read it. And uh, we, can, we can only, uh, it, it's very vivid in, in, uh, in uh, Agnes and Pauline's imagination of what happens next. Uh, maybe you can you can tell that story a little bit better than I can. Sure. Well, yeah. When when she read it, she you know said to herself, "Oh my God! Like we have a saint on our hands." Basically, like you know, then, and she really saw the full light of like who Therese was and and what she was doing. Um, and so then she said, "We we need to get more." You know, basically, we need more because it stopped at, more or less in her entrance to Carmel. You know, a little bit about it, but didn't have much on her religious life. So then she so mother agnes realized we, and she knew that therese was pretty sick by this point too you know and mm -hmm. and it he could they knew it was terminal you know and so um so then she said i have to do something you know to get this done but it's it was very sensitive you know with her and <laughs> you know now that she's not superior anymore how does she kind of make that happen um i don't know if you want to share yeah. about that yeah so then she i mean pauline then goes to the the new prioress Mother marie and uh, Marie de Gonzague and uh, has to convince her to, to, to be the one to tell Therese because <laughs> Pauline couldn't do it herself now. She's not the superior, but she has to convince the superior to tell Therese to write more. Um, and it seems like Pauline's just very wise in the way that she goes about it because at that time they had um, what, what are called circulars. And so when one of the nuns would die, um, they would write kind of a short account of that nun's life, her, you know, her early childhood and her time in religious life, what she did. 
um, and then her about her death, and then would send that out to all the Carmels, at least all the Carmels in France, I think, uh, if not others as well. And this is something that the nuns still do to do today. And so we'll occasionally in our monastery we'll get a circular from one of the Carmels and get to read really inspiring uh, events about the, the lives of these women that are otherwise very hidden. Um, and so uh, what Pauline does to convince Mother, uh, the, the prioress of the time, is she says, well, you know, we need more information about Teresa's life after she entered Carmel in order to include in this circular, um, because all we have right now is her childhood. And that she does a good job of convincing, convincing the prioress because then she goes to Therese and, and um, asks that she continue her writing. Yeah, and Agnes tells us that it was the next day. That, yeah. uh, so she did yeah, that, that little bit of uh, inter-carmel politicking between yeah. the prioress and the former prioress is really, really uh, interesting uh, dynamic there. Uh, but, of course, Therese at this time is much sicker, right? Mm. Uh, than she was when she had written the previous two manuscripts. So, it, for her, it was a it was a much it was a bigger trial even than before. Although she had more time on her hands, uh, she was very weak. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that you have you have a, a good kind of anecdote about about to the extent of her weakness at this point. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, when you when you look and actually, we're blessed to have um, the a facsimile copy of the original manuscripts. We have it here in our library. And so you can see it very clearly, you know, because the, the, the way they did it, they, they look almost the exact same as the books would have looked like that she wrote in. Um, so you, you're holding this notebook and you see as she's writing, um, you know, it's, it's, you know, very dark, very legible. But as time goes on, it gets the letters get bigger. She actually has to start writing in pencil because a pen is too difficult. Um, and then kind of her last line, and you can see, you know, in these last lines and and it's this, the beautiful image she gives of how powerful prayer is. And she says, um, it, you know, she talks about Arch Archimedes with his pillar, or, sorry, or not a pillar, um, a lever. If I had a lever and a, <laughs> help me out here, shoot. A lever and a fulcrum. fulcrum. <laughs> <laughs> um, I could move the world if I had a big enough one. And she said, and I do have that level and fulcrum, a lever and fulcrum, and it's, it's prayer, you know, and confidence. And, and as she's writing about being able to move the whole world through prayer, her hand is so weak that you can barely see the letters. And then maybe a line after it finishes because she can't write anymore and she yeah. has to stop, you know. So it just, yeah, you can really see sort of her progression, but that inner strength within her as she's doing this. Yeah, and, and so this, this, uh, this manuscript C encompasses, it does encompass her life as a nun. Uh, but it's much more reflective mm -hmm. interspersed throughout these two chapters, uh, 10 and 11, um, of some of, of her spiritual insights and in, into things going on. You know, uh, so it really it does. T it's a it's a powerful testament to to both continuing where she left off in chapter eight, but also uh, taking a different a little bit different approach to the to the project that she's writing. At this point, she knows that she's she's going to die yeah. uh, soon. And she, I think she has more of a sense, too, that other people might read this, you know, not, not by any means the, hu the whole world, you know, but, <laughs> yeah. but, uh, but that it would be for a circular, or, you know, right. that other sisters might see this. So she, you know, has an audience a little bit more in mind, mm -hmm. I think, with, the, with this one. And, um, and even just as she's writing about charity, right, she's in the, her wheelchair outside and sisters are coming, trying to be nice, but interrupting her, you know. Mm -hmm. And so she's saying, like, all right, I'm trying to put into practice, like, what I'm writing right now. You know, so you really get a sense of that, too, that she's living what she's writing. Mm. Yeah. So before Therese died, she, she gave Pauline permission to, to edit, uh, I think at this point, in, in Mother Agnes's mind, in Pauline's mind, it was just manuscript A and C. That's kind of what she, was, she had in her mind, anyway, um, until Therese died. I, Maybe she knew a little bit about the, the letter to, to Marie, but to, I don't know to what extent. Um, so she gives Pauline, uh, Mother Agnes, permission to edit what she's written uh, in order to publish it, print it, and, and send it uh, as a circular letter to the other Carmels. Mm -hmm. um, so in this permission, and uh, you know, Pauline does exercise the permission that Therese gave her, um, so maybe we can talk a little bit about this stage after Therese has passed away. Um, Pauline very quickly 
um, probably you know emboldened by the message itself, uh, really goes right to work in preparing the circular circular letter, right, editing it for publication. So maybe we can talk a little bit about that as well. Yeah. I think we see to some degree that um, they they recognized uh, Pauline, Mother Agnes recognized like the the importance of the message that Therese was was out to send, but she didn't as much appreciate the way that Therese what told told the message. And so um, she saw a need to make a lot of edits to the manuscript to make it more accessible to people. And just you can see, I mean, Therese, the way her writing style was so different to perhaps others at that time, especially spiritual writing at that time. Um, Therese was just very kind of almost direct, kind of straight to the point, um, told things like they were. And uh, that wasn't really the common way of writing at that time. So I think Pauline perhaps saw this need to make make these edits to make the, the message of Therese more accessible mm -hmm. uh, to those that it was going to be sent to. And so she ended up making a lot of edit, editing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in, in, at one counting, it's 7,000 changes, uh, which is, as an editor, I know that, that I make a lot of changes when I'm editing an author's work, but... 7,000 is quite significant amount of changes. Uh, and she also, and this maybe makes a little bit of sense knowing that it was going to be prepared as a circular letter, she uh, cuts it down by about a third. Mm -hmm. uh, so a third of the original is, is parsed out um, of the, what, what is published and sent to the, to the Carmels. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't uh, you know, get mad at Pauline or anything <laughs> like that because in reality, in, in God's providence, this is the version that God wanted yeah. out because this is the version that, that got Therese canonized. Yep. <laughs> so, <laughs> so in a sense, you know, that those stylistic changes that Pauline made were perhaps, um, uh, you know, in, in wisdom, right, to, to, to do that in order to make the writing more accessible for people to read. Yeah. Um, so uh, another kind of important change, well, manuscript B is put in into this into this section and also um, all of the manuscripts the addressees are changed mm -hmm. to the current prioress mother Marie Dickens Hogg um, and that was that was a request by the prioress to be made uh, so when we have when you have an, an early edition of story of the soul uh, prior in English prior to 1979 um, all of the manuscripts, all of the all, all the chapters at this point, because there's no manuscript division in the English versions until nineteen until nineteen seventies, but they're all addressed to Mother Marie de Gonzague. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one thing that we notice, and I think some of Pauline's stylistic changes really carry over into the English as well. Yeah. Um, you'll see whenever Therese is talking about her father Saint Louis, uh, she in English it's Daddy, uh, <laughs> which has that more. Uh, you know, uh, diminutive sort of sense in it in English. But, um, you know, in, in our version, that's Papa, uh, which is literally translated, tran it's transliterated directly from the French. That's what, that's what she actually wrote, it's Papa. Uh, so you get that sense in, in some of the early manuscripts of these changes that, that Pauline made. Yes. Yeah, and even, um, even what, what we had talked about in previous episodes about some of the Stereotypes of Saint Therese, you know, can are sometimes rooted in, in some of those changes too, you know, like just making the language a little more flowery at times, or just not her fresh kind of direct style that is, you know, so indicative of Therese. Um, that might have come through in a way too to make people, you know, it it of course made a huge impact, like you said, got her canonized, but it might have turned some people off too mm -hmm. um, because it wasn't truly her, you know, um, so kind of goes both ways right you know because of these edits i think this is why it's very important that everyone find on your shelf your version of story of the soul and yeah. and make sure you have the ics <laughs> version uh, because otherwise you're not reading the whole story right you're missing a third of it and it, and it is it is quite different in, yeah. in substantive ways um we uh, i brought our two versions here uh so for people to see who are watching um but this is the this is sort of the straight text um, and this is a study edition that also includes, you can uh, see um, in here, there's a study guide after every chapter that has uh, more reflections um, and context, right? But yeah, those, those uh, so the John, we'll talk about the, the translation process in a little bit later in this episode in a few minutes. 
Um, but what is really interesting is uh, Uncle Isidore comes back into the picture when it comes to the, the transmission of the, of the manuscripts to, the, to be distributed as circular letters. Uh, but he actually bankrolls the whole thing. Mm -hmm. uh, at this point, uh, Isidore's daughter, Therese's first cousin, uh, Marie, this is Marie of the Eucharist, uh, is, is a member, becomes a Carmelite nun in the Carmel of the Sioux. So now you have, the, now you have uh, four sisters yeah. and a first cousin <laughs> <laughs> all together uh, in, this one, in this one Carmel. Um, and, uh, and Marie was, would, have, would have been a novice of, of Therese as the assistant novice mistress. So that's kind of an interesting. Marie also was the next to die. She died very yeah, early. That's uh, right. Maybe only seven years, I think, after Therese. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, Uncle Isidore, we can thank for, for getting the story of the soul into people's hands. But, mm -hmm. you know, right from the, the get-go, they publish, they print 2,000 copies mm -hmm. of Story of the Soul uh, for the circular letter. And it's, it's sold out within a year, within 12 months of, of printing it. And it took about a year from, the, from Therese's death to the, for it to be printed, which is probably longer than they expected. Yeah. Um, but within a year of the first printing, they, they're out of copies and they, they print 4,000 more mm -hmm. uh, the next year. Uh, so that's in 1899. Uh, and by 1906, her cause is open. Yeah. So you can see really how quickly in the, in the span of six, seven years, uh, from this widespread distribution of, of Therese's autobiography, how quickly uh, you know, her message gets out into the world. It starts to be translated into other languages. Uh, we know that St. Elizabeth of the Trinity uh, was at the same time as this. Maybe one of you can, can share that connection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I think they, it's, it's pretty well known, I think, that Elizabeth of the Trinity actually read Story of a Soul before she even entered Carmel. Mm -hmm. Um, so that would have been very early on. You can yeah. see how this was spreading throughout France uh, pretty quickly. Yeah. Again, coming from an, a nun hidden away behind the cloister uh, walls at, uh, in an unknown town, really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she probably would have had one of the first, first second, or third printings of, yeah. of yeah. the manuscripts. Yeah. Well, it's pretty wild because I think, you know, and it, it wasn't just that she read it and, you know, enjoyed it or something, but at a a real impact on her vocational decision and her own kind of sense of her way, you know, and she really took Therese as a patron even before she was even thought about being canonized, you mm -hmm. know, just that people recognize this is a saint, you know, they really saw that and this is good, solid teaching. Um, I, I like um, on the, there's the, the archives of Lisieux have a, have a website and just all kinds of neat little <laughs> kind of historical things, but they have like the first notes, you know, thank you notes basically that came to the Carmel of Lisieux right after the publication. It was literally a day later because it was published on, most would agree that was October 21st is when they was officially published. 1890, 1898. Yeah. yeah, so just a year after her death, mm -hmm. um, which... Does anyone know why that date is also very important? No. It's, it's actually my birthday. Oh. <laughs> so, that's why it sticks in my mind. Um, but but, uh, but literally a day later, you know, uh, someone writes and says, I'm not finished this book, but it is having a tremendous impact on me. You know, and um, one of the first copies, they say, there's an anecdote about the, the, someone who was working at the bookstore and was sold to a priest who reluctantly gave it to a woman he had met that day who was sick and like very sick and the woman read it and she was actually one of the first healings you know that was attributed to Saint Therese so it's like you can just see her message the grace you know all kind of coming together it's just that. electrifying right yeah. kind of a, and I, I can relate to that as well I mean the, the idea how many times I have given recommended story of a soul to somebody and before they get very far into it, I'm already receiving an email or a text message saying, this book is changing my life. Yeah. It's, it's very, you know, it, it does have that very quick and profound impact on people. Mm -hmm. So even, it's kind of interesting to see from day one, day one. it's had yeah. that impact. Mm -hmm. We well, see that with the, uh, I just read about the typesetters too, and before they even print it, printed the, the work, they're just preparing to print it. And the person who's working, setting the typesetting, they end up taking some of the things uh, writing them down and taking them home to their family to pray them with their family. So like already from the very beginning, before it's even pressed onto paper, it's it's already making that impact. Yeah, it's so incredible. Just to give you, I wrote a little bit of down of some of the um, the amount of mail they were getting, oh, the yeah. Lisieux Carmel. 
So by uh, by 1914, so this is a little under 20 years after Therese's death, the Carmel was getting 200 letters a day. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine receiving 200 pieces of mail a yeah. day about about story of a soul? Yeah. Um, four years later. Um, they receive, in February 1918, they receive 512 letters in a single day. Yeah. Um, and these are like, you know, 18 nuns yeah. that have a lot of other things to do. <laughs> <It's true. Yeah. laughs> um, when Therese is beatified in 1923, the Carmel is receiving between 800 and 1,000 letters per day. Um, so it really is just incredible to see how much of an impact, you know, from the, ver- from the get-go. Um, and we can see that her beatification and canonization um, were were really kind of you know made it a worldwide sort of movement, not mm-hmm. just France and, and and maybe countries where Carmelites were present in, but really worldwide. Today we have a uh, story of a soul translated into over fifty languages, mm-hmm. uh, so it really is an incredible um, testimony. Uh, she was canonized and beatified by the same Pope, Pope Pius XI, um, and and. Pius XI considered her to be, I think he says, the star of my pontificate. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is so appropriate for Therese yeah, to, yeah. Be, to be, you know, that, that uh, you know, influential in, in the <laughs> pontificate of, a, of a, a very important pope, yeah. right? So it really is kind of a neat, uh, a neat yeah, um, connection between the two. Her canonization draw, drew half a million pilgrims to Rome. And this is when they had it inside too. Yeah. You know, it wasn't like it was just an outdoor mass. It was inside the basilica. Well, there were a few. I, I, I did select over two numbers, but the the first number was how many were at the mass. Yeah. But uh, and that was I don't remember exactly, but the five the half a million was people who were who were in the square yeah. that day uh, for her canonization. Um, in 1929, uh, the future Pius XII, Cardinal Eugenio Pacelli. Uh, he's he's present in Lisieux to dedicate the, the the cornerstone of the new basilica of Saint Therese in Lisieux, and by 1944, uh, she Therese is named co-patroness of France by Pius XII. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, she's within uh, within 50 years of her death, she's she's raised to the, the same status as Joan of Arc <laughs> in France. That's, if you've ever been to France, you know how much they love Joan of Arc. <laughs> yeah. Yes, and who is her hero? You know, you think yeah. she's this little Therese compared to this huge... Yeah. So, you know, this is just to say just how much, uh, you know, how quickly the, her, her popularity spread throughout the world. And to always, you know, remember that she was just a nun in a very small... Carmel in the corner of France, mm-hmm. uh, you know, literally, and, and so, you know, uh, a new uh, another neat Carmelite connection that kind of comes in is is another is a famous friar from the 20th century, who is tasked with uh, kind of the next stage of story of the soul and its history. Um, so, so maybe we can talk a little bit about that quickly as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I think after the canonization. Um, it became more and more aware to people were just knowing that, okay, what we have in Story of the Soul isn't everything, you know, and that um, there's more, and they already had made a couple changes, like the parts were addressed, starting to be more addressed to whoever the destinarian was, you know, in the newer editions and things. Um, But still it was just that same edited work from, you know, at this point, 50 years before. And so in 1947, um, Father Marie Eugene of the Child Jesus, who was, uh, the def- one of the definitors, French Carmelite, um, who's founded Notre Dame de Vie, Secular Institute of Carmelites, and um, is now blessed Marie Eugene. Um, but he was he was very close to the message of Therese. You know, he he promoted it so much in his life. He did many retreats in Lisieux. You know, and knew the sisters very well. Actually, is um, Celine uh, Sister Genevieve said. Marie Eugene is the one closest to my sister that I've ever met. Like in terms of with a personality or just whatever it was about him reminded her most of Therese. So this very close connection with Marie Eugene and Therese and her whole family. And so now he has this authority and he writes to the Lisieux Carmel and says, now is the time, right? Like (laughs) we need, um, we need this. I think there's a nice quote. I don't know if you wanted to share, you know. Uh, So uh, Marie Eugene writes a letter to Mother Agnes, this is Pauline, and and this is towards the end of Pauline's life, but he says, 
Uh, the church has spoken. The sainthood and the doctrinal mission of St. Therese of the Child Jesus are universally recognized. From now on, she belongs to the church and to history. To avoid and to refute partial or mistaken interpretations of her doctrine, and in order that her doctrine and her soul should be still be more dis deeply understood, uh, the documents that you now that you have so generously given us are insufficient. Only the original texts can allow us to discover the movement of her thought, its living rhythm, and disclose all the light contained in her definitions, which are usually so firm and precise. So he knew that there was something there. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yes. Which is kind of interesting. Yeah. And, and of course, Mother Agnes was very hesitant. Mm. Uh, and in fact, it, was, it wasn't until uh, after her death that really the full um, disclosure of the manuscripts were made by Celine. Uh, who was the last of the sisters to pass. Yeah. And you can understand, too, I mean, with Mother Agnes, well, she was already in her late 80s at this point, you know, and also um, so much of this was, like, intimate family details, you know, and and it's hard to see, like, is this going to be helpful or, you know, well, and she was entrusted with this task and she stayed true to it. I mean, her whole religious life after the death of Therese was more or less promoting Therese, you know, and... Um, and so, yeah, how hard that would be for her to figure out how to do this or what to do. And so it kind of had to fall to someone else, in a sense, with, with Celine, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. um, later on. We see this struggle a lot more, I think, in the, the history of the letters, Therese's letters coming mm -hmm. out. Is there's, a, there's a, the hundreds of pages written at the beginning of that, uh, Therese's correspondence on that, that whole history. But you see that a lot of the letters concerning the uh, particularly the health of of her father of Saint Louis. Those are the ones that were protected, and uh, you know they didn't necessarily want all those details. Many of them were destroyed um, because it was just personal, intimate family matters. That um, yeah, it's easy for us to look back now and say like, well, they should have put all those out. It would have mm -hmm. helped so many people, but uh, at that time, it was very difficult for them to do so. Yeah, yeah. yeah so the, the the facsimiles were indeed published uh, in 1956. Um, but it's kind of interesting that the people, a lot of scholars were, of course, very interested uh, in these editions. Uh, but there was something that was, the, you know, the story of the soul that everyone knew and loved was, was kind of absent, right? It wasn't the same uh, sort of, you know, the chapterization uh, and, and, and those elements that people really came to, to appreciate in Story of the Soul. Uh, so it wasn't actually until 1971 that an edition was published that kind of combined sort of the, the, uh, the format of the, the published versions of, that Pauline edited um, with the text of the original manuscripts. So they kind of combined, they took the writing of the original manuscripts and, and kind of you know, broke them up into a way that people would, be, would remember from you know, the first time they read Story of a Soul, for instance. Uh, so, it, then in 1973, ICS Publications acquired the, the translation rights to these, the, what was the centenary edition, they called it, of the kind of hybrid of the original manuscript text, but the format of, of Pauline. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was this, this version that was translated by Father, our Father John Clark. Uh, and Father John went on to, to then translate the, the Yellow Notebook from the Last Conversations. Uh, all of the letters of Therese, um, all of these were done by Father John, and, and you know what a incredible job he did. He really, in his translation, um, sort of approach his, his his strategy. He really wanted to stay as close to the French as possible mm -hmm. um, to really to really let Therese speak for herself, right? And and we're so blessed by the work that he did. Yeah. Well, could you, would you mind, especially as the, the editor, uh, <laughs> acting editor of, <clears throat> of ICS Publications, just to say a little bit about the, the difference between, you know, our translation. I mean, we have all the manuscripts, right? We have the, mm -hmm. the exclusive right to all those manuscripts. Um, and, yeah, and so we have that. <laughs> <laughs> well, right, so the, the, the important thing, and we're very proud of this. I mean, this is something, this is, this, we're very proud of Therese and what she's done for the church. And we want, you know, her message, her original message to, to, to shine in people's hearts, right? Mm -hmm. So the, our versions of Story of the Soul, the English translations that are published by ICS, translated by Father John Clark, um, are the only available in English that are the original manuscripts. 
Uh, so that's that's an important detail, and it, it's not to you know tout you know our translation is better than this translation, but our translation is a different of a different book yeah. than other translations available yeah. in English. It, it is it is entirely different. Um, so well, I mean, it, it's it, it there's a very distinct difference in terms of editing and and uh, omissions that that Pauline made, um, but if you want the whole story of the soul. And you haven't read the John Clark translation. There's a good chance that you're going to find a lot more yeah. uh, in the second reading of of the full manuscripts, mm -hmm. and that's that's something that I think we have a duty to share with people. That's one of the reasons why I wanted to do a whole episode on kind of the history of this of this manuscripts of the three manuscripts becoming becoming the story of the soul that people know and is published today. Mm -hmm. Um, and until uh, Sunday night, they're on sale. So <laughs> one more plug for that yes. <laughs> at our website. So, so check that out if you, if you haven't read the John Clark translation. Um, and there are, you know, various publishers publish the, uh, the what are they called, the public domain yeah. English translations that were done of the, of the story of the soul early on before the original manuscripts were made available in the 19, early 1950s. Yeah. Yeah, so you'll still see like new ones being published, but it's still that same, mm -hmm. the same public domain right. manuscript. And to say something about the legacy of this translate of well, the manuscripts, not necessarily the English translation, but um, it's it's the manuscripts, the publication of the manuscripts that gets Therese promoted to Doctor of the Church, yeah. and that's an important distinction because they needed to the, the the bishops and the congregations that worked on that needed to know exactly what Therese said. They needed to be very have a very clear and concise understanding of her message, uh, and they would not have been able to do that with edited with an edited edition. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, and and it's from there that we have the beatification of, of Saint Zelie and Saint Louis, and the canonization uh, seven years later, and then now, certain servant of God Leone has, <laughs> has been thrown into the mix. Yeah. So it's you know th this is God's grace working, um, you know through various people in Therese's life as well as the, her, her successors in uh, the Carmelite family who really worked to, to promote her as someone who really is uh, the, the greatest saint of modern times. Yeah. Amen. So do either of you have any last minute ideas or thoughts to, to throw in here? So. Well, maybe I'll just say a little anecdote and um, this is kind of about the, the origin, but you know, one, one of the great, another great friar, Father uh, Mary Magdalene, I mean, uh, Father Gabriel of St. Oh, Mary Magdalene, um, who wrote Divine Intimacy, which many people are familiar with. Um, he called, you know, Father Marie Eugene into his room one day um, in Rome and said, I got something to show you, you know, and because he had had his hands on the original processes of beatification and which had, you know, the manuscripts and um, he showed, so he showed Father Marie Eugene these manuscripts. So, he, and, and then that's, you know, again, helping to start this whole process of getting those out. But it just shows how the, these, you know, she just had such an impact on these great names, you know, and, and how excited these guys were like little kids, like, look what we got here, you know, <laughs> to find some of her original words. And, and just so the power that her words have, I guess, you know, that, and that impact the greatest minds and the most simple, you know, and, and all of us, you know, we, we, found Therese through, through her works, you know, through the story of a soul and, and um, just how important that is, you know, for her, the reason why she's a saint, the reason why her sisters especially wanted her to be canonized, not was to bring some glory to themselves or to their family, but so that her message could get out. And this is, this is what it does, yeah. you know. Well, maybe to finish up, um, you know, this episode and this season uh, of Carmel Cast, I think it's been a huge blessing for all, the three of us to be able to go through the life of, of uh, our among us favorite Carmelite saint and, and, and maybe not so favorite Carmelite saint, <laughs> <laughs> but the the uh, the blessing that it's it's really brought upon all of us and to, to kind of bring that to a conclusion to read a you know a very famous uh, fan of, of Saint Therese herself and the one who who elevated her to the level of Doctor of the Church, uh, Saint himself, John Paul II. Um, this comes from the declaration of her being made a doctor, which uh, would be good to put, we'll put that link in the description of this episode, because it really is worth reading uh, the whole thing to really give a concise summary of her, of her legacy, of what, she, what she's done in the church. Um, so I'll read that, 
for, for us. And then uh, we'll see you all uh, or, you know, we'll be happy to, to, to begin again in a new season uh, this October. And uh, we'll, that's when we'll be back with more episodes. Uh, God willing. <laughs> so uh, we thank you for, for joining us uh, during this, this sort of journey that we've had. And uh, we're so grateful for all of your comments and suggestions. Uh, please keep those coming. We have an email address in the link of the, uh, provided in the, the description of the, of the podcast. So uh, please uh, let us know what you think and, and give us some feedback so that we can continue making these episodes for you uh, to the way that uh, are most helpful. Uh, to you. So with that, we'll leave it with uh, St. John Paul II. Therese of the Child Jesus is not only the youngest doctor of the church, but is also the closest to us in time, as if to emphasize the content continuity with which the Spirit of the Lord sends his messengers to the church, men and women as teachers and witnesses to the faith. In fact, whatever changes can be noted in the course of history. And despite the repercussions they usually have on the life and thought of individuals in every age, we must never lose sight of the continuity which links the doctors of the church to each other. In every historical context, they remain witnesses to the unchanging gospel. And with the light and strength that come from the Holy Spirit, they become its messengers, returning to proclaim in its purity to their contemporaries. Therese is a teacher for our time, which thirsts for the living and essential words, for heroic and credible acts of witness. For this reason, she is also loved and accepted by brothers and sisters of other Christian communities and even by non-Christians. Hey everyone, Brother Pier Giorgio here. Thanks for checking out this episode of CarmelCast. If you want to hear more of us, don't forget to click subscribe. Also, be sure to click like if you enjoyed this episode, and maybe even leave us a comment. We post discussion questions down below to get the conversation going. Want more information on Carmelite spirituality and the Discalce Carmelite Saints? Then you'll want to check out our website, www.icspublications.org. There's a link in the description of this episode. From here, you can see all our current promotions and access our complete catalog for the writings of St. John of the Cross, St. Teresa of Avila, St. Therese of Lisieux, St. Elizabeth of the Trinity, and St. Edith Stein. If you want to stay up to date on all our promotions and new titles, then be sure to add your email to our email list. There's no better way to stay up to date on the latest Carmelite publications. Thanks for joining us, and may God bless you.